match the size. Uh, whatever you've got in your fly box that's close to that size, use that fly. If it's close to the color and sort of has a similar silhouette, that's even better. But match the size. You're probably going to be fishing smaller midge pupa and larva, and, and more and more than likely, it, if you've got a, a size 22 fly with a black thread body and a rib and, and then a dub, a dub thorax, you're probably in business. That was Ed Engel talking about matching the hatch during the winter. This is episode number 59 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. I wanted to give a quick shout out to a new Patreon, Chad Kennedy. Thank you for the support. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, to get bonus content and dig a little deeper into the show. In today's episode, I interview Ed Angle, one of the go-to anglers when it comes to tying and fishing small flies. We talk about the most important thing to remember when matching the hatch, some casts that will help with presentation and the clear water for steelhead. We find out about why small fly... Um, uh, fishing and, and tying is all about simplicity and how to avoid spooking the fish. Don't miss this as Ed takes us briefly back to his experience going to Woodstock and the impact it had on him as an 18-year-old kid. Before I get into the episode today, I wanted to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. The Grey Drake produces beautiful vintage fly boxes and wallets that are handmade in the USA. Made with sustainable cork, reducing environmental impacts, and still providing for the highest quality product. A portion of all proceeds go to local fish conservation. Go to thegraydrake.com to get started today. We are also brought to you by the Portland Fly Shop, which is your winter steelhead headquarters. They stock all of the top brands and a huge selection of fly time materials. Conveniently located right off Gleason Street uh, on off of 405, it's always great to walk into the store when you're greeted by a friendly dog and a uh, and personalized service. So uh, head over to the PortlandFlyShop.com or stop in and see them today. So without further ado, here's Ed Engel. How's it going, Ed? It's going great. Could be better. Yeah, good. <laughs> good to have you on. Um, I've got a number of questions here that we're going to dig into, and uh, I think we're going to keep it focused a little bit on maybe some of the smaller flies and some of the stuff that you really, you know, you've written a lot of books about and things. But um, maybe before we jump into all that, you can talk about how you first got into fly fishing and then how you brought it to where you are now. Well, actually, I first got into fly fishing. Uh, when I moved to Colorado, I grew up in right outside of Washington D.C. and and my my dad was a uh, he fished gear and we'd fish for bluegills, warm water fish. But when I came to Colorado, uh, in the Rocky Mountains, everybody was fly fishing, and I kind of got into it uh, off of that. Uh, my friend John Girock got into it first. We were friends. We were actually we we used to read poetry. We were poets mm. and. And he got into it first, and then I was still had a spinning rod, and then pretty quickly afterwards, it looked, it looked like he was having so much fun that I got into it then. So I've basically been fly fishing hard since I was about 20. Okay. Wow. So that's, uh, okay, yeah, and I had a couple questions about uh, uh, Girok I was going to mention. So it, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about the um, the poetry. What What was that? What was that all about? You you were uh, reading poetry, writing poetry, kind of everything there. Yeah, we were writing poetry and we were reading poetry. I met him in a, a poetry class at a, a a free college, and we'd go around read poetry. And then you know you get to the point where you realize that you're uh, you're not going to make a living uh, uh, reading and writing poetry. And and the really crazy people like John and me decided we could make a living fly fishing. So. <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> that tells you a little about us. <laughs> it's so you have. I mean, I, we obviously uh, know John has made a living uh, writing books, and you've written a number yourself. I mean, have you? You've made a living out of this. Has this been your primary form of uh, income, uh, writing? And well, I I guided for twenty years, and I've I've been on the f uh, fly fishing f uh, show circuit for 
10 years and by sort of doing a bunch of stuff together, I've uh, written a lot of articles, uh, the books. I can kind of make it all work by doing a, a lot of different things. I'm not as talented a writer as, as John, but by doing a bunch of other stuff, I can make it work. Gotcha. Gotcha. What do you think? Um, you know, with John, I, I had him on in a past episode and, um, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty fun, you know, pretty fun episode to chat with him. But what, what do you think? What what sets him apart? Do you, do you know? I mean, you and actually I had a question before you answer that. Just let me, so I don't forget it. I was thinking, um, let me see if I can remember what I, he mentioned. Um, well, I'll, I'll hold it. He had something about accountability, but I'll hold that till, for a little bit. But yeah, what do you think? What, what separates uh, John from the rest of the pack? Well, I think that he's he's really dedicated to the craft and he uh, uh he really works hard at it and and that's why he's as good as he is uh and i think in my opinion each book he writes is gets better yeah no i, I his uh, recent book uh, we talked a little bit about that but the one I, I remember now the one comment he made is that um it was pretty funny he said in the interview he said um he um he likes you know something like uh you know because of the way you are oh i know what it was he was telling a story about it was really cool because we were talking about you know how sometimes people think writing's easy and basically the guy said uh, the guy was asking gear rock there like hey how do you you know what do you do with all your time you know you, you're just kind of doing all this stuff and and gear rock kind of got you know mad and basically told the guy you know he was like hey you know <laughs> who do you think writes the books basically and you and you made the comment that um you said hey that's a compliment you know, John, if, if they don't realize the effort that goes into you writing your books and, 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 uh, John, you know, said that that's why he keeps you around, he, you know, kind of jokingly, yeah. he said, um, you're the guy that keep, holds him. I mean, do you feel like you're the guy that, um, holds, uh, John Gearock accountable or in some, you know, in, in some, no, form? I, I think that we've just been good friends for so many years. It's, it's almost like we're brothers Okay, and, uh, we just sort of keep each other in line as much as that can be done gotcha gotcha cool all right good stuff well i want to uh, talk all about uh, john this one because we got a ton of um you know great uh, information to cover here with what you've done and that includes a number of books which we'll get into uh, one of them is on you know basically tying i think you uh, one on tying small flies and one on fishing them um can you talk a little bit about you know, if you if you think about small flies, I had to ask this question to George Daniel, who was on recently, and we talked a little bit about midges and things like that. But what's, you know, what's your definition of small flies? And, and are we, you know, the same question I asked George, are we talking about midges here? Or are we talking about other um, insects? Are we talking wet flies, dry flies, nymphs, kind of everything? Well, small flies, what I do is I define a, I, I mean, in general, you can call a small fly hook size 18 or smaller and that's not always been the case i mean when i first got into this uh back on the east coast if people were fishing size 16s they thought they were pretty small yeah. but i i think a size 18 is a good place to to sort of draw the line and certainly midges but there's a, like mayflies you've got trichos you've got uh, blue-winged olives you've got a number of mayflies that are uh, 18 or smaller uh, you got scuds that are smaller, and mm -hmm. certainly nymphs. Uh, you can tie wet flies smaller. I actually tie some. I uh, that I basically fish them as emergers. But yeah, you can tie a wet fly, and you can swing small flies. Mm -hmm. uh, effectively swing small flies. So I think any fly can sort of be reduced to a small fly. The thing I like about small flies is uh, they're they're so fundamental they're so basic i the only thing when it comes to tying a small fly is getting used to the small size of the hook but there's not that much stuff you can pile on to a small hook so they're not that hard to tie that's right that's right okay and maybe you can just take us down the path if you're you know getting into it maybe you're used to fishing larger you know flies and you know, you've heard a lot about the fact that fish, you know, you catch a lot of fish on small flies. Can you step us through, maybe talk about the river you fish most often? I guess the South Platte might be one, but maybe we can talk about another river just to mix up since we've talked. Uh, you know, in fact, I had a guy um, recently who kind of gave me, um, you know, <laughs> gave me a little bit of crap because I was uh, focusing a little bit too much on, on nymphs. 
you know, it was kind of funny, but I guess you can't please everybody. But um, yeah, maybe you can just walk us through the, um, you know, the process. If somebody's new to it, you know, how they might catch some fish on uh, some of those 18s and smaller flies. And then how small are you going? Oh, I've, I've gotten into, and this is kind of an affectation, but I've gotten into fishing flies as small as size 32. I don't think you have to fish them that small, but the hooks were available, and, and I just did it. Hmm. Uh, in, in fact, there's a whole school of it. There's a guy named Andy Baird who he lives in Ireland, and, and I've, he, we've corresponded a lot, and, and he ties beautiful tiny flies i i call anything 26 or 28 and smaller a tiny oh, okay. fly and you can catch fish on these things and it's just kind of it's just seeing if you can do it more yeah. than anything else uh in terms of of small flies in general the reason you're going to end up fishing small flies is because that's what the trout are eating most of these tail waters in spring creeks they they don't have as wide a range of temperatures and they don't have the diversity of, of insect hatches that, that you might find in a free flowing stream. A tailwater is a regulated river below a dam. But what really does well in, in these tailwaters is midges, the smaller mayflies. So you have these smaller flies. And so if your fishing life is around a tailwater like mine. I have to fish a small fly gotcha. to catch fish. I don't think I'd go on a small stream and, and fish small flies if I didn't have to. I'd probably fish yep. larger flies. But uh, yep. if, if the fish make you do it, you do it. No, that makes sense. Yeah, so you're not finding – so in those spring cricks and tailwaters, you're not finding too many of these giant um, stone flies or, you know, some big October caddis. You're just not seeing many as many of those big bugs out there. Oh, you really don't. I, I, the farther you go downstream, the more – diversity you'll get but the biggest we see on our tailwaters here is pretty much a a green drake and that's only on one river that i know of gotcha. uh offhand that's the frying pan river where you get a green drake hatch but they're mostly pretty small and and uh there's fewer species so the fish key on the species they're more particular and the other thing about tailwaters, too, that can make them a little tough is, is you have so many people fishing them. They usually fish them year-round, so the fish see a lot yeah. of flies. That's right. That's right. They get they get used to stuff. Well, maybe you can think, uh, you know, if somebody was going to be out in, you know, I guess fishing tailwaters, they're, they're, some of them are, are pretty similar. Can you talk about, like, when and where to fish? Um, I mean, let's take, say, the, this time of year, if you're going into, like, December, January, the winter months, talk about how, you know, kind of where you might fish and you know the best time of the year and are are you fishing year round out there yeah you can fish year round in fact in colorado our our uh fishing season's year round but the thing i've noticed throughout the country is a lot of these tailwaters will be open year round but the rest of the water in the state will will be closed and i think it's because they can control it better on tailwaters this time of year you're probably going to be nymphing a lot. You're probably going to be looking at, at midges, but you will get hatches. I, there's a real good hatch on my home water, the South Platte River, real good midge hatch on it, usually February. Mm. This time of year, December, it can be pretty dead, but you might even catch a blue-winged olive hatch, which is unusual, but certainly you'll see some midges, but you, you probably want to nymph fish. Gotcha. And you can use... Uh, uh, Euro techniques where you've got an anchor fly and then you've got some smaller flies as droppers, or you can just uh, fish a weighted fly and, and trail an unweighted small fly behind it, which will kind of mm-hmm. well up in the current and look like an emerging insect. Uh, there's lots of ways you can do it. You sure. can fish with stripe yeah. indicators, but a lot of nymphing this time of year would be a little slow, but come mid January, you'll start seeing more and more midge activity on a lot of these tailwaters out west. Okay. That would be, in in my state, it'd be South Platte River. Gotcha. It'd be uh, the Frying Pan. Uh, it would maybe be the Arkansas River in some spots. Uh, and you fish them closer to the dam because tailwaters have this, the water's uh, cooler in the summer and warmer in the 
winter time and so mm-hmm. it stays open the metabolism of the fish is a little bit higher so you have a little more active fishing you still freeze but you pick your day <laughs> mm-hmm. well maybe uh maybe you can just talk a little bit about i mean to just take us through a year that might be helpful i know there's i talked to definitely people that are out there that i mean there's beginners that are probably listening to this that have no idea um but yeah maybe you can just start so you were talking in january can you just walk us through like a, a typical year and, and, and have you fished i mean I, I assume you fished out there throughout the entire uh, year on the tailwater sure in fact i used to fish a lot in the winter time because i i was uh i worked in the i was a forest service firefighter and i get laid off in the uh winter time and so i just go fish but starting in january you can get up on the river you'll start getting hatches uh, of, of midges, you can actually get some dry fly stuff almost in, in the middle of the month. And certainly you've always got, uh, uh, nymphing where you can midge February. It gets even a little bit better by March. You might start getting a few blue winged olives. Uh, if, and blue winged olive is, is a, a may fly, mm-hmm. a smaller may fly by April. You're certainly going to get hatches, uh, of blue winged olives. And are blue winged olives May, typically are the blue winged olives in the typical average size? Are those 18s in that range? They'll they'll usually I usually fish size 20 or 22 patterns. Okay. Uh, for them and and you can nymph fish them. Uh, the the nymphs are are swimmers, and so I I like to have a real active nymph imitation. I I, I like to I I might activate it and lift it a little bit or, a- or I might. What would be a, a pattern? Um, that I know you have a number of your own patterns. Do you have a, a good swimmer uh, blue winged olive pattern that you use? Oh, the pheasant tail is oh, great, okay. but I pheasant tail is probably the the best pattern in the world for that. But you can also fish. I tie a little. Uh, it just has an olive body, and then I take the the uh, after shaft feather from a, a Hungarian partridge, and the after shaft feather it looks like a little bit of it, the the breast feathers on a Hungarian partridge and you can make a a little wet fly out of it. And I'll fish those a lot. I'll cast them at rising fish or sometimes I'll kind of swing them a little bit in the current. Uh, but I like unweighted, Mm -hmm. uh, pheasant tail nymphs and all, cause they're a little more active. So no beads, no beads or anything. I won't use beads. I, I might have a, a bead head fly somewhere in the rig, yep. but I always want one unweighted fly in that rig somewhere. Uh, what I like to do is uh, tie into a weighted fly, and then I'll trail an unweighted nymph behind it, and, and I'll trail it like 18 inches behind, and that thing will sort of go up and down in the water column, acting pretty mm-hmm. much like a, a, a nymph does, mm-hmm. a swimming nymph. <laughs> and uh, it's a little harder to detect the strike, but I mean they hit those pretty hard because the fish are figuring they'll get away. Yeah. So it's, okay. it's not too not too tough to detect the strike. Okay. So that's uh, so that's kind of in the so now we're into April as we get into kind of the April May June. Do things keep changing as far as um, well in yeah. in in uh, and you get you know each tailwater has some some hatches that others don't, but. Uh, typically on tailwater in the West, you'll get, uh, blue winged olives, you'll get pale morning duns, which may actually be 18s or 16s. And then you'll get trichos, which are real important. Trichos come on July 1st. Uh, the PMDs will come on June or July. Uh, and you get these huge spinner falls. Uh, but not every tailwater has these these flies i call them the big little three the the mm-hmm. blue winged olives the pale morning duns and the trichos and and one stream may have uh a blue winged olives and pmds but not trichos another may have trichos but no pmds but there's always one of those families and they'll go on you'll get hatches into october and then october you'll start getting uh uh, brown trout will start spawning and mm. you get some stuff where you kind of want to start fishing a streamer or a bigger wet fly, but you can still fish small flies. You'll, you'll get 
hatches year-round on most of these tailwaters. Something will be hatching. Okay. You go to midges when it gets cold. Gotcha. So that's it. So then once you come in October, November, you're back to more more uh, uh, prolific midges for the most part. Midges, yeah, nymphing, you know, that sort of thing, yeah. Gotcha. And then what about, um, I saw something that you mentioned, something about, I think it was a, some blue flies, some color, blue coloration you had in the wintertime. Is that, can you talk a little about coloration on flies and what typically, how that works and if a blue fly is better in the, the wintertime? Well, the blue flies, this is a real interesting thing. And, and I, I learned all this from a, another guide friend of mine named Stan Benton. And he, he'd been reading some research about what trout eat and, and the biologists who were doing the experiment, they dyed a bunch of uh, salmon eggs different colors. And they found out that the fish would take the blue colored salmon eggs against m- any colored background more often than any other colored egg. And, you know, there's nothing out there that's blue no. <laughs> that, that we can see. So what he did is he tied some blue crystal flash on a hook and he used uh, a, a blue or, or black thorax on the thing and uh, uh, started catching fish. He started catching fish. And we both noticed that you you would seem to catch more in the winter time on this. And it's one of those flies where if the fish is on this thing, I mean, they really go nuts on it. And like any fly, it doesn't work every day. But uh, on some days, it's sort of the secret fly. But I think the story behind it's interesting. And, you know, a lot of steelheaders, like like the, yeah. the hardware guys, will use blue blue spoons right. on this stuff or, or blue blades. And so there's something to it. But yeah. I, I, I haven't read any science. It's just seems yep. to... No, that's true. I, I was just actually tying uh, just yesterday a... Um a steelhead fly, um, I can't remember which one, but yeah, it had some, uh, had some blue, a big blue hackle, a big, uh, kingfisher blue, you know, on the front, everything else, there was no other yeah. blue on the fly, but that, you know, it just stuck out. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So they were and they were using blue color, just a little bit of blue crystal flash. It wasn't necessarily a specific pattern, just some added color on it. They used just wrapping blue crystal flash around the hook and the original pattern by, by stand, he used, uh, blue Arizona yarn, which you can't get anymore. And what I do now is I just tie a midge on a, usually on a size, uh, 20 or 22, uh, curved hook, like a TMC 2488. Mm -hmm. And then I just will tie, uh, a a black thorax on the thing and, and the blue, but, uh, uh, this this would be the time of year where that sort of thing would start working. Water's real clear. It's real low. Uh, uh, but that's one of the few flies I've ever fished that uh, it's just one fish after another on a day when it was working. Because most of the time, I think it's more technique than yeah. the fly. Yeah, yeah, uh, for but sure. once in a while, you get a fly that just kills yep. them, and that, yep. that'll do it sometimes. Huh. No, that's cool. What, um, what would you tell somebody, you know, thinking again, somebody that may be struggling a little bit, to, to catch fish and um you know would, what, what would you tell them to um you know maybe a tip or something you know if we're talking about smaller flies to uh, to help them get into some fish that's kind of a tough one i mean the first thing that comes to mind is uh to be honest i'd say get a guide and, and go out with a guide one yeah. day and and sort of get some ideas on on techniques but a, a lot of it's detecting strikes uh get closer to the fish. A lot of these tailwaters, you can get closer to the fish. If you're fishing on top, uh, it really makes a difference if you can see the fly. Mm. I mean, people, they'll say, oh, I know where that fly is drifting and all that, but you may be uh, a few milliseconds behind on setting up on the fish and you'll miss them. If you can see the fly on the surface, you'll have a lot better chance of, of hooking up. And, and all those obvious things, I mean, if you set too hard, you're going to break the fish off if you're fishing 6X, but yeah. uh, you sort of learn that over time. But if, if you're not sure where to find the fish, a lot of times a, a guide can, yep. can show you a few spots and you can, you can at least get started, get some ideas, uh, particularly if it's your home river. Uh, it never hurts uh, mm-hmm. to do that. I, I never had the benefit of guides, and it took me, 
I think when I started fishing the South Platte River, it was over a year before I ever caught a fish. Yep. <laughs> now that's uh, that is a good point. That's uh, definitely. You know, we've talked about that before. It's, you know, probably save you the, the headache and it'll probably save you money over time by just getting a guide, you know, you know, to help you get started. But, um, uh, yeah, that is, that is kind of a tough one. What, and, and as far as, you know, you're getting close to these fish, is there any way, you know, how do you avoid spooking the fish or some of these fish a little bit spooky and how do you get close enough to them that you, you can catch Sometimes. them get on top without spooking them? Well, I'll, I, I'll make an approach. If I don't have to get in the water, I don't get in the water. If I'm wading, I try to wade very quietly. And then I'll, I'll usually be, I'll get myself uh, downstream and across from them. I like to make an upstream and a, a cross cast. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of the fish in tailwaters, if they're in deeper water, they're not real spooky. They're not like the fish you see. Uh, if, if I go into the high country here, and I'm not very careful. I'll spook fish, you know, when I'm way downstream mm-hmm. from them. Uh, I don't know what that's all about. And I've noticed it in spring creeks, too. They don't tend to be real spooky. Maybe it's because of the pressure. I mean, if, if if they'd spook every time they saw the fishermen, they'd never eat. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you can true. get pretty close to them. And, and what you'll find out is is you'll – most of the tailwaters are clear, so you, or spring creeks and tailwaters – they're clear, and if you uh, have a pair of Polaroids, you can see, often see the fish. And and I tried to just approach from downstream. But if that fish is suspended in the water column, if it's elevated in the water column, it's probably actively feeding or will be. If you spook them, a lot of times they'll go down to the bottom. They won't spook to hiding cover, hmm. but they'll go down to the bottom and just sit there. And that's a fish you should rest or just go fish somewhere else and come back later and try to catch that fish. Yep. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good tip. Yeah, I was just thinking, I think, um, I think you know, that's something that's come up before where we were talking just about covering the water. And there's been a number of people I've had on. We talked, uh, you know, before we got started here. Uh, a few people from Colorado, actually, I'm just realizing as I get into it that there's, you know, a number of great guides and people that are doing similar things, you know, to what you've done and you've been doing a while. How do you, you know, how would you say you're different from somebody like a, a George Daniel or any of the other people that are fishing those tailwaters out there? What is there any separation there between kind of you and others or just people out there, or, you know, as people listen to this, or is it kind of, are you guys all doing the same thing? Well, George Daniel is actually a Pennsylvania fisherman. That's and right. He comes out, That's and right. He comes out here. Uh, I I would say I was that, thinking that, I, actually I was thinking uh, I did get George mixed in there with um, Landon Mayer, who we talked about streamers and um, gosh, who was the other? I'll have to check back. I guess Devin Olson, but he's a Utah. <laughs> so now maybe I have maybe I haven't had that many Colorado guys on here. Well, you a lot of our water. The Rocky Mountains are real similar, particularly Utah and Colorado. Yeah. You, we, we tend to fish a, a lot of nymphs. Streamers are just getting popular. Uh, uh, everybody sort of has their specialty. Like nobody, nobody fishes the uh, South Park area uh, of, of, of the South Platte River better than, than land, and he's fished it as long as I've known him since he was in high school. Mm. and. He's, he's just got real good eyes, and he sort of specializes in these larger migratory fish. I've kind of specialized in in matching hatches and matching uh, patterns to hatches uh, mm-hmm. and, and fishing nymphs or fishing on top. I started off fishing uh, nymphs a lot and, and really got to where I was, was pretty competent with them, and now I'll fish nymphs, but if something's coming up, I immediately put them away because I, I like to fish yep. on top. I think that's what the sport sort of originated as and yep. it's all about. Sometimes I joke that nymphing should be a separate sport, but uh, people get mad at <laughs> People get mad at it. I love that. No, I love that because I just had, I'm not sure, uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, I don't know if you know Hank Patterson or heard of him. He's, uh, uh-uh. he, yeah. So Hank Patterson is the greatest, uh, fly fishing guide in the world, the self-proclaimed greatest guide. So if, if you have a chance afterward, t- take a look, I, I, uh, I can't find the episode, but he, um, 
uh, I think somewhere, yeah, he was on in a past episode, but um, he was talking, uh, hit one of his little skits was, um, yeah, basically just hit on that, how nymph fishing is like, if you want to be a real fisherman, you, you should probably fish with dries, you know, just kind of a, you know, playing on that whole thing there. But um, I mean, there is some truth to it because, you know, um, you know, I've also had Gary Borger on and he talked about how when he started nymph fishing back in the day, re- people really frowned on it. I mean, but I, but I hear what you're saying because you get to a certain point where you've fished so much and you've got it for 20 years that dry flies is kind of pretty amazing. You know, how, how can you get better than getting to come to surface on a dry fly? Well, and, well, and, and you can even refine that. The perfect dry fly take is a lot of times a fish will come up and you'll see them rising to naturals and they'll take your dry and it'll be different take. It'll be almost like that fly bothers them on the surface. But if you, if you can get the fish to come up and take your dry fly exactly like it's taking the naturals, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful thing to see. I mean, there's nothing better than, than a rising trout, but, uh, uh, and when I guided, even if I thought my persons, if I had a beginner and we were nymph fishing, which would mean they could get into some fish and have a good time, but I would still, if we had rising fish, I would take the the nymphs off Hmm. and, and introduce them to dry fly fishing and just say, well, this is part of the sport. The fish are rising. Maybe you should fish to them. Although I see more and more people just nymphing through rises now. Oh, you do. Yep. Yep. You can catch fish any way you want. I mean, you know, it's it's a sport, but I, I, I like to, to sort of catch them at what they're doing. You know, it's funny is that what it is kind of analogy. I always make the steelhead analogy, but, um, same thing, you know, you can nymph fish for steelhead with egg patterns and get down, you know, down and dirty, same thing like nymphing for trout, but swinging them up, you know, or even the extreme is swinging them up on dry flies. Right. I mean, that's, right. that's the ultimate. And some people even go to the level where they're swinging in the winter time for steelhead where maybe they catch one fish every, you know, <laughs> month or something. But yeah, so there's different levels of extreme, and I, I hear you uh, on the dry. That's really cool, though, on matching the hatch. Maybe we can dig into that a little bit. We talked about going through the, the year a little bit on different hatches. How, you know, so you get there, say, this time of year in January. Where do you start with determining what's coming off? What do you put on? You know, how do you find the right fly to use? Well, I'll, I'll look for uh, insects hatching, and, and the winter time's kind of easy because it's going to be a midge. It's the only thing mm-hmm. that hatches year round but i at least if you're beginning or it's not your home water it really pays to to get a fly get a natural get one of those flies in hand and take a look at it figure out what size it is uh and that's i think that's the most important the size match the size uh whatever you've got in your fly box that's close to that size use that fly if it's close to the color and sort of has a similar silhouette that's even better but match the size you're probably going to be fishing smaller midge pupa and larva and and more and more than likely it if you've got a a size 22 fly with a black thread body and a rib and mm-hmm. and then a dub a dub thorax you're probably in business that's it uh, that's it that's all it takes this time of year it's a little more complicated when you get into dry flies there's a lot more yep. you things that you can sort of gotcha. fool around with but this time of year it'd be it'd be midge midge pupa and larva okay and and so when you cast you're mentioning you you're casting kind of upstream and across to keep from spooking the fish once that fly hits the water can you talk about your presentation or leading up to that how do you present that fly properly well basically you want to have a slack line cast and and you got to move to the level where you can make slack line cast whether it's a reach cast whether it's a a parachute cast or a stop cast some way where you can get slack in your leader uh on on the fly and and another presentation you can do that's a little bit uh hairier is you can drift your fly straight downstream to the trout but you got to remember that you might have to be farther upstream. You might want to be closer to the bank where you can it can break up your silhouette, uh, but cast downstream to the fish, and the first mm-hmm. thing the fish sees is is your fly. Uh, the downside of that is the fish may see you. The other thing is when the fish takes the fly, you've got to hesitate before you set. This is a little bit like fishing wet flies. 
Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. The Portland Fly Shop, lo- located in the Pearl District in downtown Portland, with over 50 years of combined fly fishing experience in the Pacific Northwest. The Portland Fly Shop has all the gear and knowledge you need to find success, whether on the river or behind the vice. One of Hairline's top 100 dealers in the nation, they have a great fly tying selection and carry all of the top brands, including Sage, Loomis, Hatch, Airflow, and many more. They are your winner steelhead at cores with over 13 years of guiding experience and 20 years of professional fly tying knowledge. They will get you dialed in on the vice or on the rotter. And I remember actually when I first met uh, Jason, it was a number of years ago in another fly shop, and I knew right away that he totally knew his stuff and he was a super cool guy. So it was pretty cool and surprising when I walked into the Portland shop for the first time and saw the same friendly face there that I remembered from a few years back. So a uh, really cool local story here. Um, they offer a wide range of guided trips, um, adventures up to the Olympic Peninsula and Upper Columbia if you want to kind of get out there without having to go too far. And uh, you can give them a call at uh, 503-265-8060 or visit them online at theportlandflyshop.com. Portland, born and bred, on sign parking, just two turns off of 405. We are also brought to you by The Gray Drake, who produces high-quality vintage fly wallets and boxes. Their motto, progress through tradition, respect through stewardship. The fly wallets are handmade in the USA with sustainable cork, uh, and these boxes are naturally self-healing, which essentially means that it holds it can hold a little tiny midge or some big daddy stone flies and it'll last and and hold the flies for years to come the whole river wallet is kind of the rolls royce of fly storage double line leather and calf skin protects your flies high quality wool um, includes um, a way to pull out moisture out of the fly and you'll definitely be proud to pass this one on to the next generation. I personally have, you know, I've always loved the fly wallets. I remember studying the old wallets that were passed down from my grandfather and, and my dad. And there's nothing that really comes close to feeling those old, those old, uh, you know, those wallets. And, and tell Roy, you know, the, the wallet the great Drake has here is kind of sharing that same tradition. So it's pretty cool, classic feel and reminds me of, kind of the old days so right now the great drake is donating a portion of proceeds from all sales through the end of the year to wild steelheaders united to help defend remaining runs of wild steelhead in the pacific northwest and idaho head over to thegraydrake.com to grab your fly box wallet today that's t-h-e-g-r-e-y drake.com okay back to the show Okay, so yeah, and that so that downstream, and you're just casting down, and then kind of doing a uh, kind of a slack cast or dropping it on, or uh, yeah, yeah. What you'll do is downstream, you can put S curve slacks by, or or you can do a a, a parachute cast, which yep. is is basically where where you take all the energy out of the fly line and it just piles on the surface. They also call it a pile cast. Yep, uh, and that can be good. Uh, but you got to have cast. You, you've you've got to have uh, slack line casts in in your toolbox to 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 really move to the next level. Uh, the most basic cast for this is just casting. Stand in the same drift lane that the trout's rising in, and just cast upstream to mm-hmm. it. Uh, not so far that the fly line spooks the fish. I mean, that's the first dry fly cast any of us learn and you can turn that into a nymphing cast too if you put Mm -hmm. a little tuck in it yeah i know that's um those are those are good points yeah the uh it's always uh yeah again you know coming from a beginner perspective i think you know those are definitely good points to make that there's not just one way to do it um but yeah, you can easily spook the fish. I mean, if you're, if your leader or, I mean, especially your fly line lands on top of them, do you find that that's a pretty much, you lost that fish? That'll put them down for a while. Yep. That'll often put them down for a while, unless they're really crazy. If it's a super heavy, uh, trico spinner fall, a lot of times they're, they're just so preoccupied with feeding that, that they'll, they'll let you make a few mistakes. Mm. Uh, yep. uh, but that can just be a hard hatch for other reasons, just because there's so many naturals on the water surface. You got to figure out a way to, you, <laughs> you just got to keep casting. I mean, you got to be really persistent uh, on those because then the fish get smarter every week. The first week they're, they're dumb as doorknobs, <laughs> but by a month or two, 
<clears throat> it's a challenge. Nice, nice. Yeah, I want to. Um, yeah, I want to keep digging into some of this here because I have a few more questions. But I did have a note that um, I want to touch base a little bit on your background. Uh, the Forest Service. You had a book. I think uh, the title was seasonal, and, and I think it's got kind of a, a cult following, uh, or you know, so to speak. Can you talk a little bit about you know that that book and you know what um, what got you to the point of writing a book about your experience? Um, I guess fighting fires is that was it, or was it more than? Just well, that? I was. I would fight fires. I marked timber. Uh, I I would cruise timber. Uh, it was a great experience. I did it for about thirteen years, uh, and the book it just wasn't its time. Uh, but people still buy it and they still read it, but it went out of print almost immediately. And in Mm. fact, I, I, they were going to take all the books to the dump and I just got the books and sold them myself. Uh, but it was about the times in the forest service and, uh, it's amazing just being out in the woods five days or six days a week, uh, and, and cruising timber or, or doing these timber surveys, you see it in a whole different way. And, uh, uh, really get a sense of it, and then of course I could could fish. Uh, <laughs> I I remember I was a, a seasonal in Idaho for one year, and you're talking about steelhead fishing in, in the winter time and how you can catch one, one fish in a month. Well, when I was up there fishing the clear water, they figured if you were fly fishing at that time, eighty angler hours per steelhead. Wow! Holy cow! <laughs> yeah, that was the. That was a grind. <laughs> no kidding. Yep. And now there's a lot more, and I think I think the steelhead techniques have improved to where people have a better shot at these. That's fish. right. Yeah. Yeah. But, yep. Yeah. Lines and rods. Everything's been totally optimized. Huh. Yeah, because we were just fishing single hand. Yep. You know, single hand rods, and but that was the the largest uh, uh, subspecies of steelhead in the world would migrate up the clear water to the north clear water until it was dammed. Hmm. But that was the largest species of steelhead known. Right, right. Largest. Eye. So that was cool. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Now they've got, uh, well, yeah, there's a lot of obstacles in the way and lots of work being done trying to get those back. But, um, well, I guess, um, yeah, we'll have to leave some of the, the steel. And do you do a little steelhead fishing still? I do a little bit, but I'm not too good at it. Yeah. You know, I've caught a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a, I, well, I think that's a lot of people, you know, if you don't, if you don't go into it all in, the, you know, it's probably what you're going to, you're going to get is a few. Um, but, uh, okay, cool. So yeah, the forest service was basically, you just had, you know, a, a good chunk of time there where you were pretty much outdoors all the time. I mean, is there, what got you kind of out of it or was that something that was just a temporary gig? Well, what happened was uh, I was a seasonal employee, and it was pretty clear that I wasn't going to get on permanent, but I liked the work. But the whole time I was doing that, they'd lay me off in the wintertime, and I was fishing. I was writing newspaper columns. Then I started writing magazine columns. Then I kind of got into guiding, and it got to the point where I could make as good a living uh, guiding and, and writing stories and books magazine articles and writing books as I could in the forest service. And, and the, that was a dead end. I I mean, I was on as a seasonal longer than, than most. And so then I got into, uh, doing what I do now. And, and that was, that wasn't a mistake, but I'm really glad that I was able to work in the forest service in the days when I did, because, uh, uh, it was really fun to be out there. You just, you like, if, if, a lot of our surveys, you would just take a compass bearing and walk through the woods and every uh, certain, every, let's say, it used to be in chains, which is, is a surveyor's term, but let's say every hundred feet you'd stop. But you learn a lot about the woods just walking through on an azimuth because, mm-hmm. you know, nobody does that. You're on a trail, you're doing right. something, but you just see a lot of stuff you'd never see. Huh. Uh, doing that it was it, it was a lot of fun i, gotcha. I really enjoyed it. and what and what uh, year what years were these or what gosh year? i think i uh, from 76 uh maybe till 1990 or some somewhere like oh, okay. that yeah so you were in there yeah. so did you see a big chunk yeah. of i mean the forest service and that whole thing has gone through a lot of the you know issues with like um 
you know, tree sitting and the whole conservation environmentalism stuff, did you, were you seeing old growth trees out there and did you get involved in all that stuff? Well, we would see old growth trees, but we never did much. And they basically got out of the timber business while I was still still working there because they, they realized that uh, the trees just don't grow fast enough here. And, no. and so they really, they really kind of quit logging. It wasn't like out in the Northwest. I did work up in Northern Idaho for a while. That was a real timber factory, but yep. you, you saw the results of it too. You'd see these little streams silted up with four feet of silt yep. and, and there's going to be no steelhead or anything coming up those. No, no, that's, uh, that's, that's right. No, it's, that's, that's, that's cool. That's an interesting part of your, your, uh, you know, your life there and, and, but yeah, you went all in and, uh, guiding. And so, and that's another question on the guiding. So you did that for 20 years and I guess eventually you just get to a point where you're ready to move on and kind of had a full career of it and take the next step. Well, what it. happened yeah. to me is, is the outfitter that I was working for retired and rather than start in Colorado, if you're a guide, you got to work for an outfitter or be an outfitter. And rather than start all over, I just figured I, I would write and, and focus more on doing public speaking and, and visiting clubs and doing the fly fishing show. Mm -hmm. uh, and you do get to a point, I was getting older, and I was noticing that I, I didn't quite have the same amount of patience that <laughs> I used to have. And you've got to be patient if you're a guy, yeah. particularly if you're with beginners. Uh, it's, it's crucial. I, I've worked in some guide schools and all over the years, and I always tell them, I, I mean, I can take anybody out and and turn them into where they'll know where the fish are and they can turn people on to fish. But people skills are really important. Yep. Guiding, you got to have both. You got to be able to find fish and uh, help people learn what they want to learn. That's right. Uh, That's right. A lot to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, yeah, let's see. I think we're doing okay here on time. Um, yeah, maybe we can... Uh, I had a couple, I've always got a couple of questions I like to ask, um, you know, just, just some general stuff. Um, one of them is, I guess that I call this the, the two, 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 your, you know, your, your top two flies, top two, um, tips and top two resources. Could you talk about that for when we talk about small flies, if you kind of had to narrow it down to those, those few things? Well, the top two, my top dry fly is, is a fly that, Honestly, I've I've got a second edition of these small fly books coming out, and it's it's a Japanese gentleman showed it to me, and it's basically just a a gray thread body and a, and a hackle and a a bright fluorescent orange wing. That's my my favorite <laughs> top water fly for you catch uh, blue winged olive hatches on it, you you'll do midges on it. It's a great fly when it comes to nymphs. Uh, you can't go wrong with a pheasant tail or hare deer. Yeah. There's a million new flies, but those flies have stood the test of time. And I always tell people, if you give me a, a, a prince, a pheasant tail, and a hare's ear in the right size for the water I'm fishing, I'll catch a fish any place you put me. Yep. They're they're just great flies. Yeah, isn't it? It's the, well, two of them, I mean, I guess peacock is, is one of the materials in a couple of them. And then the hare's ear just kind of, I mean, what makes the hair's ear, do you think, so... I mean, again, that's different colorations. You can tie that in all sorts of different colorations as well. I think it's because it's so spiky. You're using yeah. that spike dubbing, and and I think that captures air bubbles, and it's just buggy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's amazing how how those flies just just work wherever <laughs> you go. Yep. I, I mean, it's... And, and you know, uh, Copper John's getting into that category, too. Yeah. That's a newer fly. Uh, that that really does well in a variety of of rivers and conditions. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. There's a yeah, that's another good one. There are a bunch. I mean, and the one that um, you know gets a lot of talk. I've got into the Euro nymphing stuff a lot, and you see a lot of these bugs coming out now. Um, I'll go to some of the names. This the soft hill, uh, soft tackle carrot. You know, there's just some of these things that, and some of them don't even have legs or anything. They're just like a stripped down, very you know, a slim profile fly. Do you fish any of that stuff or get into in like the jig hooks and all that kind of different, or, you know, there's all that different stuff going on. Do, are you more traditional on that, that style? I, I have fished that stuff. I don't have the kind of expertise that some people have. 
Uh, I think a lot of that uh, Euro-style nymphing that makes it really effective is you're getting your flies where the fish are. And and you're it, it it's not really a match the hatch thing. I yeah. I mean they're they're attractor patterns and and a lot of them they have hot spots. Yeah. They're flashy and you put them in front of the fish. And to me, what what Euro nymphing styles and there's a million different styles of of Czech style type Euro nymphing style stuff. What it does is it opens up water types. It opens up heavier water types that you just can't fish any other way. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what's been important about it. Uh, I'm not that much into competitive fly fishing, but a lot of these uh, competitive guys, their patterns and their techniques are kind of trickling down to to us regular fishermen, and, and we're taking what we want and and not using what we don't want and it's improved Mm -hmm. people's ability to uh, catch fish that's right that's right and you mentioned you know the leaders that is a big part of it these really thin leaders can you talk a little bit about when you you know maybe you're tying on some of these small these dries that you're talking about what what your leader setup looks like typically when you're fishing those those small dries if i'm fishing a a single small dry on the surface i basically will go to 6x I, I try not to go to 7X unless it's a real small fly. I like nylon leaders. Uh, I even like nylon leaders when I nymph fish, although sometimes I'll use a fluorocarbon leader uh, if I'm in water where I think the fish can rub me off. Mm-hmm. Or a lot of times if you're, if you're euro-nymphing, you're pounding through real heavy water and you need something that's abrasion-resistant, and the fluorocarbon's good for that, but... I, I like a standard nylon leader because it, it absorbs a, a certain amount of water and it sinks a little bit. I think it's harder for the, the fish to see, but I'll just, uh, I like to get by with the shortest leader I can. A lot of times that'll be nine or 10 feet. Uh, there's a movement. A lot of, a lot of the, the small fly guys are fishing super long mm-hmm. leaders. In fact, a lot of the Euro styles yeah. are fishing 20 foot leaders. That's right. Uh, but they're hard to handle, particularly if you're a beginner. Uh, yeah. it, it may sound real seductive, but they're hard to handle, and it can be frustrating. Uh, so I keep them as short as I can. If i got to have a long leader, of course I do it, but I, I don't do it as a, uh, yeah. as, pr- as a practice unless I have to. Okay. And, and are you used like a typical like a five-weight line, or what's your line set up there? I use four weights and five weights. And I also, I, I experimented with uh, one weights, uh, which was a very interesting hmm. thing because I, I had a, uh, a friend of mine who works for Orvis gave me one of their uh, one weights, and it was a full flex rod. And I, I didn't think there was much to these. I, I sort of didn't, I thought they were just sort of a, yep. a toy. But the thing I found on these was I could fish uh, small flies to, to larger trout. And that fly or that rod would bend over double <laughs> when I hooked when I hooked up, and the fish didn't know it was hooked. Huh. And and I could guide the fish to the net, and I huh. I can net fish faster than I can if I'm I'm fishing a four or five weight. Of course, if they figure me out and take off, well right. then it gets and you're done. you know it turns into a rodeo. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 cool. Yeah, one weight you don't hear much about one weight, or well, even two weights and things like that. Usually it's a uh, Three. Well, I guess you're t- fishing really small, tiny, small creeks and fish than than at one or two weight. Well, I was fishing big water. I was yeah. catching eighteen inch fish wow. on them. Catch them, catch getting them to the net really fast. Uh, I thought wind would be a problem, and if you can cast cast in one weight, you know the dynamics are the same as as larger rods. The place where you get messed up is is if you don't have dry flies and you got to go to nymphing because oh. you can't nymph with the things oh. they're only like seven feet long or something oh, yeah. oh, but so, if you yeah. know there's if you know there's going to be a hatch well yeah it's it's a lot of fun to fish that thing hmm. okay well let's bring it back so the the two two and two so do you have um a couple more i know you mentioned some tips here along the way any any other tips for tying uh tying or fishing those small some of the small flies most important thing is get as close as you can without spooking the fish. That's true for dry flies and nymphs. And you may spook a few fish, and then you learn, well, you got to back up a, how, a little bit. How close is the closest you've ever gotten to a fish that you've hooked? 
Well, I've hooked them six or eight feet away, yeah. just lowering my profile and getting in close. Uh, a lot of times, if they're if they're taking trichos or they're taking midges, and there's a lot, they'll be so close to the surface feeding that they their their window of visibility is nothing, and you can get close to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second tip on that would be use as strong a tippet as you can. Uh, don't go below six X unless you really have to. Uh, cause a lot of times it's, you, you can, your presentation will cover up, uh, that little bit bigger leader. Sometimes mm-hmm. if you lose using a fly that's so small, you'll have to go to a seven X. And if I fish these size 32s, yeah. I'll, I'll go to an eight X or a nine X sometimes. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, um, and do you have a couple of, um, resources, maybe a book magazine, other websites, stuff that's maybe not your own that you have gone to in the past, or you'd recommend other people to, to learn about some of this stuff? Uh, uh, yeah, there's a guy named Takahashi. Mm -hmm. I think his name's Takahashi who wrote a book on midge tying midges. That's a real good book on, on tying midges. Uh, and Andy Baird, uh, mm-hmm. has a, a website or a podcast or a website called, uh, small fly funk. He's a, he's the guy over in Ireland and that's, that's a great resource. He just has pictures on it, but uh, the guy's an incredible tire of small flies. And, and so that's a, a, a good resource. And then anything else, I mean, with the internet now, you can just stick small flies in and, and something will come up. Uh, yep. there's, I can't think of any other, uh, Daryl Martin wrote a really interesting book on small flies that I don't think got the, the kind of recognition it should have. It's called micro patterns. And I don't know if that's still in print or not, okay. but that's a, that's a fun book. Okay, cool. Cool. Y'all, uh, at, uh, wetflyswing.com slash 59, I'll have, uh, links to those resources you mentioned and anything else we talked about here. And that was, uh, yeah, Takahashi. I've, I've heard of that before. So that, that'll be good to Rick Takahashi. Yeah. His yeah. Book's good. Cool. Cool. That'll be good to, to dig into some of that. Okay. Um, if you think about, you know, your life, obviously you've been through some times, you know, getting back to gear rock, we talked a little bit about the sixties and <laughs> had some pretty funny questions to, we talked about there, but you know, is there, as you look back, you know, you had the forest service stuff and the guiding, you know, was there anything that kind of you see as that influence you kind of getting to, um, you know, go all in on the fly fishing thing, or is it something that you kind of always, well, you said you meant, you met John, that was probably a big uh, turning point. I always fished and I, I always wanted to, I, I was always interested in writing and, and clearly, unless I wanted to teach in a university the poetry wasn't going to work and what i saw in fly fishing was it was an opportunity to to be a writer and and also fish i mean to me they both go hand in hand i i'm kind of more of a technical writer uh how to stuff but uh it's really served me while well and it it gave me that opportunity to, to do two things that I, I really like doing. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it wouldn't be as much fun just being a fly fisherman or just being a writer. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, uh, I'd been writing stories a few years before the movie uh, A River mm-hmm. Runs Through It came out. And I was just in the right place and I had the goods. It could have been anybody else. I was just lucky. Oh. So basically you were just, you had written a, a book, a couple of books by then when that first came out. I'd written, I'd, I was writing articles by oh, then. Gotcha. And, yeah. and the, the periodicals were real popular and, and oh, yeah. fly fishing was really on the way up. And then when that movie hit, it was all over the place. It was, yeah, that was huge. That was yeah. in the uh, mid nineties, I think, or somewhere in there. Um, yeah, what was I, your, can you take us to that moment when you first, uh, I'm not sure if you wrote your first book, um, after writing, you know, magazines, but what that felt like when you got that published? Uh, it was great. Yeah. It was a book called fly fishing, the tailwaters, which is out of print. Now it was mm-hmm. the first book that exclusively talked about tailwaters. And, uh, that was, yeah, that was a great feeling. Uh, <laughs> never made much money off of it because I didn't know anything about contracts, but I just wanted to get it into print. And then since then, uh, it's been, yeah, it's been great. I mean, I, 
you know, I I, I couldn't have done better. I've yeah. just been real huh. real lucky. Well, what and, did and real happy? And I like did, meeting all my fishers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've you've been around for a while. I mean, what? Um, so so basically, th- in that that first book. I mean, you kind of just got it out there, um, and you know, but it got you in. And then you've wrote, you've written a few books since then. You've uh, do you have six books out now? Uh, I guess it might be close. I've got the small flies books. I've got a book called Trout Lessons. The tailwater books out of print. Uh, seasonal was out there. It's out of print, and I'm I'm working on a second edition of the Small Flies books, which okay. which will be out sometime next year, uh, and and we're going to combine it into one book, and uh, it'll be like one of the Small Flies books that had black and white photos. It'll have color photos, so oh, cool. that's kind of exciting. Uh, okay. But yeah, I think I've got five or six books. I don't, I, I don't keep track. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, and I'll have links to, to, to some of those books, um, there they can find your, go to your website. Um, but you've tied, I mean, I guess tying flies is another, you know, thing that we, we all, most of us do any, um, any tips on tying? Do you have a, a tip maybe for tying the, the small flies? Do you, do you tie most of your, your small stuff? Oh yeah. I, I tie almost all of my flies. Uh, just be patient. Uh, once you get the proportions down, it'll be easy. Uh, for years, I was really nearsighted, so I didn't need any magnification. I, I could just uh, look at the flies, but I've since then I've had cataract surgery, so now I'm mm. like everyone else. And you need to figure out whatever sort of mag- <clears throat> magnification will do the job for you. Uh, I'm, I'm still figuring that stuff out yep. uh, now that I've you know, that I'm like most other people and have regular eyes, but, uh, uh, some sort of magnification, uh, but, uh, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't let it, it bother you there. Small flies are, are very easy. It's all simplicity. The whole sm- yeah. small fly thing is having as little between you and the fish as possible. I, to me, that's what small flies are all about. That's cool. That's cool. So you can actually tie them uh, faster than you can in the other bigger flies because there's not as much material. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. One packet of dubbing will last your there whole you life. There, there's one, <laughs> there's one advantage and reason to go into the small flies right there. You'll save a bunch of money. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I just want to hit on a little bit on uh, mentors. You mentioned a couple people. I'm not sure if they were, you consider them mentors, but you know, and, and obviously uh, gear rock was a friend of your, or is a friend of yours. Are there other mentors, you know, over your life and fly fishing that have, you know, or writing, you know, that have influenced you kind of getting where you are. AK best, mm. AK best really influenced me. I, AK best taught me what it was or what it is to be a fly fisher. Uh, uh, just sort of, uh, catching fish the way you want to catch fish. It's it's better to catch one fish the way you want than 20 fish mm. some other way. Uh, a guy named Gary Anderson out in, in Washington State uh, was a big influence on me. And uh, Masakui out in uh, California mm. has, has really influenced the way I think. And, and all these, a lot of these guys, they just, they just fish. They're not writers or anything like that. They just uh, love fishing. But I've learned a lot from all of those people. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool. And and in terms of writing, I mostly just talking with with John Gearock, and we both are 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 real interested in the writing of of Tom McGuane, Jim yeah. Aunt Harris. Those those folks are are been a real big influence in in my life, my writing life. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The uh... I, th- I think I mentioned this uh, at least another one other time, but yeah, he, uh, John mentioned that too, Mc- McGuane and how, how uh, detailed he gets in his writing, how he actually doesn't say it, but the way he talks about things, um, it's pretty unique. Is that when you're writing these how to books, or, you know, some of the stuff you do, are you thinking the same thing? Are you adding uh, stories and are you kind of going deep into the, some of this other colorful language? Well, yeah, one of the things I did differently than a lot of the writers is what I call a a narrative how to and and I'll I'll kind of I'll talk about whatever it is like how to to do something with a a small fly, but I'll I'll sort of couch it in a story or something something I saw when I was guiding or 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 this or that and and that's 
makes it a little bit easier. I think people stay interested. I mean, if it's just pure technical text, I think it's hard for people to yep. to stay in it. And um, McWain teaches you, I, I mean, that every word counts, hmm. and and there's there's no slack in his stuff. He's hmm. uh, he's he's amazing. He's a really good writer. Yeah, yeah. That, well, and is that when you're going through your stuff? I mean, how many times are you going back through? I mean, how do you know when it's when it's ready? Well, sometimes you just got to do the best yeah. you can. But you know, once in a while, you just know a, a piece is good. But uh, uh, most of the time, what I do is I'll, I'll do several drafts. I'll read the thing out loud, and if it's kind of smooth, mm-hmm. then I figure it's ready to go. And you do have the benefit of of good editors. A good editor can make all the difference in the world. See something that I didn't see, and and really make it sound better. Yeah. Yep. No, the editor, that's a, a point. I can't remember who it was that mentioned that, but they said, um, actually, I think it was, it was, uh, Gear Rock stuff where, um, it was Steve Duda who, who was the editor of the Fly Fish Journal. And, um, yeah, and he has to edit some people. You have to edit a lot, but he said that everything that John turns in is just, it's completely ready to go. He doesn't have to touch it, which seems, seems pretty uh that's pretty amazing knowing that uh how difficult writing is so that's that's kind of cool there's yeah there's a, a lot of people you, they write stories but they they may not be writers at heart i was always a writer at heart and that's one of the reasons why uh i was able to make a, a living because i could send the how-to stuff in and the editors knew they wouldn't have to edit it mm. much and yep that was an advantage for me and, of That's course, it. an advantage for them. That's it. That's it. Okay. Uh, well, are you ready for a, a little quick a little rapid-fire round here to, to finish it up? Sure. I just had a few, uh, just some, some quick little questions here. Um, I I guess one, one quick one thinking about, you know, um, you know, I guess breaking off flies and things like that. If you, if you get hooked up, is there a quick little tip or anything you do when you're snagged up with some of the light leaders that, to get your fly off? Oh, sometimes I'll, I, I, I try not to, to keep pulling on the thing and I'll just throw a, a, a roll cast and hope yeah. I can pull it off. But flies are so easy to, to tie. If I break it off, that's okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess they, they don't cost you much. Just the, the time is pretty low there. Okay. And, um, what about your, if you think about your kind of go to one piece of gear that you, you know, use out there, it doesn't necessarily have to be fly fishing, but something, you know, on your travels or when you're out fishing or, or, or traveling that you gotta you gotta have when you leave home. Lara bars. Oh yeah, there you go. What, uh, I, what, what, I, what kind? I I eat Lara <laughs> bars. I I like the peanut butter cookie. Gearock turned me on to okay. the peanut butter cookie, and it's great. Awesome, awesome. I do. Yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm more of a um, well, I, I do like the, the those bars too, the um, uh, Cliff bars and stuff. Yeah, I know that that stuff keeps you going for sure. Okay, and uh, what is the uh, just briefly. Um, you know, if you could say in a sentence, uh, a product of the 1960s, I, I guess that's, you know, you guys went through that phase, um, or, you know, I've talked to John about it, but does it, what does that mean to you? Is there a, a way to sum that up in a sentence? What the sixties meant to me? Yeah. Just, just, well, I, I, I went to, I went to Woodstock. And oh, you it did? Changed my life. Yeah. I, I, I went to Woodstock and I was, it totally changed my wow. way. Oh, so you were there with, uh, with Jimi Hendrix doing the. I was there. I still got the tickets. <laughs> wow. Okay. We got to just, just for a second, go down that road. What, um, cause I, I totally, I mean, that's something that I, I just, I'm bummed that I, I missed that, you know, that whole thing, you know, but, uh, what, what was it? So what, if you look at Woodstock, obviously it, the, everything that was going on, but what was your big, um, you know, what do you remember most out of, about it? Well, number one, that it didn't blow up and everybody started getting on each other's case and, and, it was just kind of the the beginning of a of an era, or maybe the end of an era, where things were were peaceful. Everybody got along, and mm. and uh, you know, it, it was a back. It it was. Uh, I thought it might have been sixty eight. Oh, sixty eight. Okay, uh, sixty eight or sixty nine. It's coming up to the fiftieth anniversary. Wow. Here, here. It's either this year or. Yep. Maybe it's 69. I, I, I'd have to look back at it. But everybody got along. <laughs> uh was a lot of fun. And it was a, a back-to-earth sort of thing. It's it's this whole kind of 
and and I'm still interested in that uh, 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 the natural world. My my degree, my college stuff is biology and and all of that. But uh, and then the music. I mean, the oh, music man. was great. Yeah. So so you yeah. go there, and uh, so you just travel across the country, or was it was it next door for you? Or what? I was uh, I was living in in outside of Washington D.C. Okay. I was I was only like eighteen. Yeah. Uh, like I I think it was my senior year in high school. I was still living at my parents' house, huh. and and you know none of us had any idea that it was going to be so big. No. Uh, I thought it was just going to be a standard concert, but really? at the time I was interested in music. Uh, played in a band like everybody else <laughs> they did what was your, uh... not not very well <laughs> yeah yeah well what, other than Jimi hendrix who, who else who was your favorites there who i can't remember everybody who was uh... crosby stills and nash oh, was yeah. great the grateful dead was, oh, was great they played. at that wow. thing yeah because yeah. i'd never i you know i didn't know much about them at the time yeah uh, but those those are the two standouts that i Gotcha. I really remember being interested in, and Santana was really good. Oh, and Santana. Yeah. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Yeah, so the Grateful Dead, and you weren't a, you didn't get into the whole um, Grateful Dead, the Deadhead thing, necessarily. Like people... No, that was, I think I was too old for that and, and oh, too okay. independent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. All right, well, that's that's good, a little, uh, little uh, glimpse down that road. So, okay, well, uh, let's see here. Let's see if I have anything left for you. I, I did have a few other things I think we'll probably um, maybe have to leave uh, till next time. But um, uh, is there anything else you want to touch on here as far as small flies or anything else we didn't cover today? I mean, we, we've kind of touched on briefly on a lot of things here. Uh, I think we pretty much covered everything. I, I mean, I, I always... Uh, like to say how much I appreciate meeting all the other fly fishermen out there, mm-hmm. fly fishermen, fly fisher women, the other guides. It's a great sport. Yeah. I, I mean, it's been good to me. It's a wonderful sport, and uh, uh, I can't say enough about it. The people, you just meet the, the, the best people in it, so it's yep. it's, it's really nice. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I'm i kind of new, you know, fairly newer to the, you know, meeting all the, the big name people out there the last year. Now I'm almost up to 60 episodes, done an episode every week now. Um, wow. Yeah, I've kept it going. I've, I've got actually, in fact, today is, yeah, I think I'm exactly a year into this thing now, 60 episodes. Wow. Um, so I've, I've got a good string going and I'm going to hit another 60 um, here this next year. But I guess my, my one last one, if you look back at your... You know, if we bring it back to your twenty-year-old self, so you were at Woodstock in eight, at eighteen. Any any words of advice you would give yourself back when you were twenty? On now that you know, you know you've had your life, you know, kind of all these years of fishing and, and everything else. I think I've been pretty lucky. I I never worked well. I I never dealt well with authority, and the fact that I could work with the Forest Service and then just work for myself as a Mm-hmm. Uh, a fly fishing guide and a fly fishing writer uh it's been really good for me it's, yeah. it's it was a great path for me to go that's cool that's good stuff okay well ed uh yeah if, uh, in the next six to 12 months do you have any uh thing you want to note any big things coming out or new things coming out in the next uh, year or so no i'm just going to try to fish i try to fish a hundred days a year and, oh, wow. and last year i didn't because i was working on a bunch of writing projects so that's my my main thing is to try to get back on the water because uh, guided for years and you're not yeah. fishing when you guide and some of my some of my uh, uh, ability sort of declined and so I'm trying to get that back so yeah. hopefully I'll get and fish a bunch. Okay, and do you have any uh, like a bucket list or a place that you go or do you you stick pretty much close to home there with the trout? I'm doing small. I'm doing small mountain streams and and high lakes now, mm-hmm. uh, trying to get away from the crowds. And that's not small flies, but I'll always have a soft spot for tailwaters and spring creeks. I'll always fish them. I, I really like that kind of fishing. But mm-hmm. I'm trying to sort of stretch out and fish some of these small free stones now. Yeah. Okay. And what what do you think with those spring uh, creeks? What is the thing you you like most about those fishing those tiny little for somebody who's never fished the tiny little creeks like what what is it that really is so amazing about them i like the solitude uh i i like the fact that that you're going to catch fish but there's always something that'll surprise you there's there's often a pretty good sized fish somewhere in those Hmm. streams but 
most of all, I, I like getting away, uh, getting away from other people and, and yeah. just being out there on, on my own. That's it. That's it. Okay. Well, if uh, people want to find you, I guess they can go to uh, edangleflyfishing.com. That's right. All right. And uh, yeah, I guess that's that's all I have for you. Ed, I just want to thank you for coming on and giving us some advice here. I think uh, there's definitely some, some stuff we talked about here that I haven't covered yet on small flies and, and some of the tailwater stuff. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing your uh, your knowledge. Well, thanks for inviting me. You bet. I'll see you later. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 59. That's five, nine. And a little shout out again to uh, our new patron, Chad. Boom, chakalaka. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And a buck will get you started. Um, pretty sweet deal we have over there. I've got some information on so appreciate that. Uh, easy way to sub- uh, subscribe to the show is to uh, text um, uh, WFS to 31996. And this will get you a quick uh, text sent back to you where you can subscribe. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to see you maybe at uh, a show uh, online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.